This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colnut, and with me today is Steve Wilde, Head of Sales at Sky AdSmart. And we're going to be discussing what's new in TV advertising. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thank you, Scott. In this episode, we're going to discuss what's new in TV advertising. We haven't discussed that much on the podcast recently. We've discussed a little bit more about classic ads on the podcast, but not about new technology, current trends, and the areas where, Steve, I hope you're leading in Sky AdSmart. So why don't you kick things off by describing a little bit about what you do at Sky AdSmart. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me on to the podcast, um, Scott. Um, so I'm Steve Wilde, Head of Sales um, for Sky AdSmart. Sky Media has, um, for many years, over 30 years, um, been in the market to sell advertising on TV. Um, and what we've done, although we call this new, uh, we're next year 10 years in um, selling addressable TV. And the platform that we do that with, which is leading the world um, in addressable TV, is called AdSmart. AdSmart from Sky. And it says what it does in the tin. It's smart advertising. And it's it, it's, it, it opens up the opportunity for any brand of any size to, to use TV, where most won't realize um, that we can serve an ad to individual homes and to the exclusion of anybody that's not in the target audience that the client wants to target. So it is quite clever. It's quite um, an eye-opener once you realize it can be done. And most clients, once they've done it, stick with it and, and, and scale up and, and continue to use it on a regular basis. So 10 years in, how, how long into the industry are you? So um, I, I started out within ITV when it was many companies um, back the last century. Um, and uh, I stepped away um, when things were kind of all pulling together. And I went to work for an internet company that was putting video online before four years before YouTube started, um, which were uh, a bit too early. Unfortunately, broadband wasn't great in those days, back in the early part of the 2000s. And... Um, uh, but we, we we carried the first video advertising online, sort of kind of streamed advertising from um, Sony Ericsson back in the day and worked with Yahoo and plenty of other businesses. Um, I stepped out of that and went to work within in the music sector because we licensed the European video catalogue from EMI and Universal to play on online. And um, we were the first to do that. And um, I ended up working with all the major record labels and some of the independents in the UK doing brand partnership deals. Came back into traditional world of media with Sky just over five years ago. So I was out for a little while. Um, and it's quite a big big challenge to come back to a big corporate when you've been doing your own thing for 15, 16 years. Um, but it was a, a really interesting one. And the real reason that it worked and the real reason why I wanted to do it was because ad smart and addressable TV and Sky are such dynamic opportunities within media that it kind of certainly gets you to want to get out of bed in the morning to work because it's always changing. It's always, there's always something new. And hopefully across the next hour, I can explain some of those things that m people may not know. I've not heard that phrase addressable TV before. What does that mean? So usually our conversation with a client is starts with, do you do targeted marketing? And of course, most people will say yes, because they maybe use digital or social media, if they're a SME. Um, and by the very nature of doing targeted marketing, it's about selecting those audiences that you would like to target and avoiding the ones that you don't feel are going to resonate with your brand or your messaging. Um, addressable TV, and that uh, addressable TV means that we because of the set-top box in the room, whether you're a Virgin household or a Sky household, so we represent Virgin and Sky, with the dynamic, with, with, with the um, set-top box in the room, which is how you watch your TV, um, we know the address of the household that we are serving that customer content. And therefore, we can absolutely, down to the household level, serve advertising which is addressable on the TV. Um, there's lots of talk about addressable TV or connected TV. Most of it, in the UK, certainly, and in other countries, um, is not really down to the level of granularity that I've talked about there, there because there isn't a set-top box in the room. So, you know, we kind of stand apart from anybody else in the UK, for sure, with the ability to target just individual households. So ordinarily, if you've got two households, one next door to the other, the other, and they live on the same street and they're watching the same program, it might be The Last of Us on Sky, then go to the ad break and you get a linear traditional TV ad will then serve to the whole of the country to everybody that's watching that program. But ad addressable TV and ad smart allows us, enables us to 
effectively overlay a 30 second, usually it's a 30 second ad, overlay an ad over the ads everybody else sees nationally. They don't, the customer, the viewer, knows nothing different other than that they are then seeing an ad that is more relevant to them. And the relevance is all, is the key thing really from a client point of view. Most clients who um, use AdSmart target around about 15 to 20% of the available audience because that's all that's relevant to them. So why waste your budget um, on targeting the other 80, 85% of the audience that you might reach if you're on a national campaign if they're not appropriate? I know you'll be reluctant to talk about competition or other peers in this space, but you mentioned there some of the benefits of Sky Ad Smart. Are there competitors that are doing things similar? If so, who are they and how do you differ from them? At its core, because there is nobody else that has a set top box in the way that we do in the household, which if, you, if you're going to a um, multi-channel viewing, whether you're choosing Virgin or Sky in the household, um, you've kind of decided that the normal TV routes of ITV Channel 4 um, and BBC aren't enough for you. So you want a wider choice. You may be buying into sport, movies, news, whatever it might be. So in the multi-channel environment, because the set-top box sits there in your room, or as of last year, the sky glass sits there in your room, we can serve ads onto that. We can we can load ads onto that set-top box and then deliver them just to that audience because they're the only audience that the, the client wants to reach. Actually, nobody else can do it in the same way down to the granularity of an actual postcode, full postcode, the house, because we know the customer's address because we've gone in to, know, to, to enable them with a set-top box and a satellite dish or sky glass. Um, we know the actual address, whereas most of the connected TV or um, other video-on-demand TV options talk about being addressable, but they're either addressable, but they're not on telly. It's all about IP address, or they're on telly, but it's not really addressable. You, know, you can go into certain apps in a connected TV environment and load in whatever address, whatever name, whatever age you like, and you'll still get to the content. That's not particularly going to help a client be very specific about the individuals and the profile within the household. So, you know, we know we've got the set-top box in the household, therefore we can load an ad and we serve it relevant. But there's a huge amount of data that sits behind that to enable us to um, define an audience for a client to help them choose which are the best households to target. One of the things that stands out to me, and I was thinking about this coming into this episode, is I've seen the promotional push from Sky to sell the Sky Glass product over these last few years and the, the development of that product. And I was thinking about how, at least to me, set-top boxes seem a little bit old school now. Like People are trying to minimize the number of devices, it seems, in their homes. And if you can have a smart TV of some sort, generally for, I guess, most of the population... That's a better alternative. You want everything streamlined. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming there that it sounds like the set-top box is important for your USPs as a company, at least now. But that will change with the development of something like Skyglass. If more people have Sky products, you're still able to serve the same solution for them technically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's about two months away. Um, so as yeah. you rightly point out, Skyglass launched um, over a year and a half ago now. Yeah. And we've got to get into the critical mass uh, where the capability is there to switch on the addressable TV environment right. we just talked about without the use of a satellite, without the use of a satellite um, outside and without the use of a box inside because right. everything goes through a sky glass. Um, if you're familiar with it, it's our streaming TV solution. Um, so you just need good broadband. You don't need a box. You don't need a satellite. And it's a far more intuitive um, environment that the customer gets to view through. But it will be enabled in the next couple of months for us to be able to serve addressable right. advertising in the way that we've done it on AdSmart for the last 10 years. So, yeah, yeah. It's very exciting because I don't know if you've had a chance to see or experience Sky Glass, but it is, it is something else in terms of sound and vision. And um, it just gives you the capability to be able to um, view TV, a beautiful TV yeah. on your wall. You know, most people are buying 65-inch TV, so yeah. it's certainly not the case that TV is dead as I've been to here at certain digital conferences. People watch TV, people watch proper content. It's kind of brand safe. And that's the that's the environment we're serving into because we're able to play a whole ad at full length. And if, if people fast forward partway through it, 
and they haven't seen 75% of the ad or they change channel or turn the TV off before they've seen 75% of the ad, we don't charge for that impression. We don't count any value towards it. Yeah. Whereas in uh, maybe other digital platforms, it's quite a different experience, but you still get charged even if the ad might be pixelating with no sound in the corner of your laptop. And does this extend, I'm thinking about uh, mobile devices and other devices now, do you have the technology in place to extend to other mobile devices at this point or is that coming in the future? Yeah, so that's there already, um, yep. but we're only just managing to uh, combine the targeting. So the, the yeah. targeting by address, addressability um, is is kind of first and foremost by the AdSmart um, environment that I just mentioned. But because yeah. we recognize the majority of the IP addresses in that household as well, then we can serve ads to the devices that they're watching other content on. Um, yeah. So we can serve in the digital space. We can serve in the video on demand space where that is a, a, la- a growing proportion of how people consume content. You know, we're all familiar with maybe not watching so much linear programming that is mm-hmm. in a schedule, but choosing to watch video on demand and watching a box set when you want to watch it. And in that respect, you're generally more engaged with the content because you've specifically chosen it. So there's an mm-hmm. even higher resonance of getting um, uh, attraction from from the from the advertiser if they are targeting the right households. So we, we target fundamentally by addressable TV through Outsmart, and now we're able to add on video on demand as well as digital to either retarget or to target the audience that hasn't seen the ad that we can still reach through the digital environment. So it is very much multi-platform, and that's that's what we call one campaign addressable. Right. It's all one campaign. We sell it across all platforms. It's by impression to each household. It's the same targeting, and we can give a report and show you how the reach and frequency builds for the relevant audience across the different platforms that are utilized, and then combine it overall. So you can see you're getting to reach as much of the relevant audience as possible in an effective way. So what are the requirements? If, if someone listening to this, they own a business, um, they're a marketer, and they're like, okay, I really want to understand more about uh, Sky AdSmart. What are the requirements for businesses to get involved? An, un- an understanding of how, how it can work so that it can give us a, a really good brief as to who the target audience they want to target is. Because the more we know about that, the more honed it is that we can deliver the advertising. It generally, I kind of ask the other way around, in a way, if, if an advertiser hasn't used TV in the past, why is it? And, and generally, it's because they expect it to cost millions of pounds to be on TV and have a big campaign nationally. You can do ad smart campaign from three grand upwards. And we've made it that level and we've maintained it at that level for 10 years because we believe that's an, a, an entry point where there's many clients who are maybe SMEs who, you know, that's the kind of budget they spend in digital and social environment. So we are, you know, in, in competing for those pounds that they use for targeted marketing and digital. So we start with three grand upwards. That doesn't buy you everything. And we've got clients who spend three grand and we've got clients who spend a million and a half pounds on campaigns and everything in between. Um, but it's about finding the level at which you're happy to kind of test and learn with your first budget. So you don't have to you know, mortgage the whole company on the back of a campaign for TV. So first off, you know, the, 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 the monetary commitment isn't what people expect. So that kind of ticks the box. The second reason um, people haven't done TV in the past is um, because they are too fearful of, of much wastage, as I said earlier. For a long, long time, people have talked about you know, 20% of your advertising works if only you could just target 20% of the audience that you reach. Well, now you can. So you don't have wastage, so you're not paying for something that you don't want. So that's a tick in the box. And I think the third, um, the third reason why people, the clients have struggled to come to terms with spending money on TV is because they can't, how do they attribute that they know TV worked as part of the marketing mix? You know, as we all know, marketers have a more difficult job now than probably ever because there's so many more marketing channels. So how do you find the right mix? We know that by advertising on TV, we can, uh, there's a number of the insight reports that we can do with third parties that work with us where we can attribute that we know they've seen the ad and they've ended up on the client's website, or we know they've seen the ad and they become a customer. So that's all to do with data share and data share agreements, obviously, and the GDP environment, um, the GDPR. Um, but um, that, that helps us tick the box and say, you know, you know that this and the ad was seen by. The, the the customer. So even if they didn't go directly, they might have gone to Google to search about the brand that they've seen the advertising from. They still may end up on the website or they may still become a customer. So TV 
does play a part. It's always been a great branding tool from the marketing perspective, but now we can actually show how it works in terms of response as well. So we spent a lot of money across the last couple of years and won, won awards across Europe for the insight reporting that we're doing with our third party partners. So, you know, kind of tick the box of attribution now. The fourth thing that we don't do, but clients always need to have when it comes to doing a TV campaign is a TV ad. So we very regularly recommend creatives that are appropriate in maybe the location or the specific type of a creative that somebody's after so that the creative agency can do the thing that they do best, uh, work with the client, get under their skin, understand the brand, understand what they're try- trying to say, what the messaging is. And that's probably not the best place for me as a media person to be part of that, that role because yeah. the creative environment is quite a, a different thing. So that's the one thing we don't do, but we do put clients who haven't got creative agencies in place in touch and they can choose from the recommendations. And, and it's very important that they do choose a creative agency that's used to making TV ads because ideally it's a 30 second ad. You've got to go through Clearcast to get it onto TV and you've got to upload it in the right way to Sky. Yeah. So there's a bit of process to the creative element as well. So, you know, kind of we tick the boxes pretty much from what clients that, that t- take the risk out of it from a client point of view and also. We've got lots of case studies across many sectors because of what we've been doing for the last two, 10 years to help de-risk um, any client that wants to try and use it for the first time. Yeah, so I'm hearing that um, people listening that are maybe thinking about TV advertising, haven't explored TV advertising for a long time. Essentially, people like me, I, don't, I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about modern TV advertising. Mm. But maybe, maybe these people like me would be surprised to learn that it's more accessible than ever. So it's available to a wider range of businesses with a lower, a lower cost investment than maybe you would expect. And also a lower barrier to entry when it comes to actually creating the creative um, for the ads as well. Um, are there any other common myths about modern TV advertising that you would be keen to bust in this episode? Things that you get challenged with that come up a lot where these things aren't actually a problem, but people might think that they are? I think that there's there in certain in certain sectors, some people think that that people don't watch television anymore, wow. and that they only watch video online, and that, that is so wrong. Um, the, you know, the audience that TV's maintained pretty much maintained its audience for the last you know now compared to ten years ago, when a lot of the the sort of video digital play wasn't even in the mix. Um, they're watching it differently. It's not all about linear scheduled TV. It's not always about recorded TV, which is where we deliver AdSmart, but it is about VOD, um, uh, video on demand as well. Um, But the the total audience that's watching TV and content on TV hasn't changed at all. In fact, over COVID times, it went up quite significantly because people were at home a lot more. Um, And I think that's probably the biggest myth that there are certain sectors of the market who will have if you think that no one watches television anymore. That's just not the case. Yeah. On the flip side of that, um, which of the sectors do you find are most successful? So are almost a no-brainer. In terms of clients and advertisers? Yeah. Wow. They're really, we've got examples through sectors that range from the local plumber in Seven Oaks to a funeral director to a council in, in any part of the country who wants to advertise to get people to foster children, which is arguably the most difficult thing you could possibly advertise mm. on TV. Yeah. Um, through to Maserati, McLaren, Princess Yachts, you know, high end luxury who only want to target 1% of the available audience, probably based in Southwest London. Um, and, and everything in between. I and mean, there, there really isn't any sector where we we struggle working with clients to help them do better marketing. I think now for a while there was a period, you know, finance is really strong for us, as is the care home sector, as is councils, because you can be very granular in terms of geography. Um, car dealers and car brands, that's always been quite a long stay. We work with now must be 20 plus universities and probably approaching that many um, private schools as well now who advertise. Obviously, they've got their own catchment and target audience, but that's fine. They can do what they need to do and spend with us what they want as long as it's more than three grand. We've worked with over 4,000 brands in that in that um, 10 years. 405 of them were new to television last year. Okay, so it's growing 
and more and more businesses are being exposed to it through their agencies or the creative agencies or their brand specialists or doing it directly with us because you can you don't need you know we can use our system to plan and the, the target the campaign and the audience and then we can report it back just like you would any digital campaign you can uh, have a report back that shows you how the campaign has been delivered in terms of impressions how the reach is building and what level of frequency we've achieved and generally we plan a campaign and end out with 85 to 90 percent reach of the audience you want to target and ideally somewhere between seven and ten times frequency across a six-week campaign that's kind of the sweet spot Knowing that, if you haven't seen the ad six times, you are probably not going to reach the highest level, the optimum level of response that you could do if people did see it six, seven, or eight times. Once you get to more than 10 times in one platform, then it, you possibly are better off spending the money targeting the impressions to other households that haven't seen the ad. But that's how we deliver the campaign. Ideally, it's you know with a seven, eight, nine times frequency across a six-week period. You only need to see an ad one, one and a half team times a week on average, as long as you're seeing it um, across that sort of kind of six-week period. What we don't, you know, that's how we deliver. We deliver the advertising in a way programmatically. We don't serve all the eight, eight ads that are relevant in the campaign on the first day just because someone's watching lots of TV. We do spread it out across the period, and that's how we believe and know that the campaigns work best. But the level of frequency, now that we can deliver into other platforms like digital and video on demand, an extra bit of reach and frequency in a slightly different environment around programs that you've chosen, that does we're starting to get some um, some research back, and this is you know, it's all fairly fresh. You know, in the last sort of three or four months, that this we've been operating this kind of one campaign scenario. And um, you can see that by adding video on demand to add smart, you can boost the re- frequency and still boost the reach that you get, and still have a higher response. So the levels of response that we get are quite often ten times the level of response that you get with digital, partly because it's brand safe it's proper programming they're real audiences but partly also because of the viewability factor so i mentioned earlier that 75 percent viewability on ad smart before you pay for impression in video on demand and in digital it's 100 percent. so whilst we'll still report what the average view through rate has been we only charge once the customer a viewer has seen 100 percent of the app otherwise we don't charge As you were talking that through, you started to touch in more detail on the targeting options that you offer via AdSmart. Could you maybe summarize some of the targeting options that are available to customers? So, I mean, it sounds like, again, location, you can go very granular, but anything beyond location? Yeah, so there's about 2,000 attributes that we can use to select a target audience, and we can overlay them um, on top of each other. So one of our most commonly used um, attributes is Experian um, as a partner. Most people know what Experian do, um, but they have, this, I think, 65 types that fall into 15 groups, and every household in the country is put into one of those types because of the profile of the household, and they've got over 550 pieces of data about in every household. Um, so we work with clients and use the kind of the tool that Experian have to select attributes that are relevant, and then the Experian system will give us a list of the in, in priority the best groups or types to target. So that's um, very commonly used by mo- by many clients. Um, also, age and affluence, affluence rather than income, usually because that's the the determinant of how much money you've got left after all your commitments, rather than just a high salary. If you've got a high salary, but you you know committed to most of that being spent, then you know, maybe you haven't got a lot of affluence to afford a big cruise or a new car or move house. So um, those are commonly used. Um, but we work with many data partners. Um, you asked earlier about the sectors that we don't do so well in. Mm. For a period of time, I think we thought and we didn't have great success or many campaigns in the retail environment, um, sort of groceries environment, I mean, not just general retail. But now we work with um, Nectar for Sainsbury's and we work for Dunhumby, with Dunhumby for Tesco's and we have been for a number of years. And that enables us not just to do a report at the end to say, well, this is how much the change of sales happened um, after your campaign. But we actively work with them to only target households that have a loyalty card for Sainsbury's Nectar card and target specific brands or shelves that are relevant to the brand that's advertising. And that, that just means that it can be 
really accurate in terms of the targeting, but at the end of it, get a report that says how they have managed to switch some loyalty, sell some product against the competitive market. Um, so we can do a lot of retail media activity now as well. You touched on, as you were talking there, the reporting aspect, which is something I'm really interested in as well. I asked a question a moment ago about maybe what would listeners be surprised to hear about TV advertising in 2023? And we talked about other things, but perhaps not reporting. Perhaps that's a surprise. Um, You had talked earlier about third-party partners that you have in place that support with the measurement side. Uh, I don't know how much you're able to share on this, but are you able to share anything on who those third-party partners are and how you do report on the attribution part? Um, yeah, we work with some of the industry um, businesses that work across other platforms as well. So I think we work with Adalizer, we work with um, uh, BDCR, BDRC for brand evaluation reporting. Um, so there's, there's quite a long, done a long list, you know, certainly not marking our homework here. And um, the reporting just gives us the ability to to track back and measure. So, yeah, so there are some clients that have run campaigns where they've got a, a big customer database and they, we can profile that for them. And so we can build an audience that is looks alike, a lookalike audience with the same profile. We can go to the extent of excluding the existing customers so that we're not targeting existing customers, but we're just targeting those that look like existing customers but aren't. Um, there was a client who, on the back of that, then ran a different creative copy offering an incentive to their exos- existing customers to maintain loyalty. Um, and you can do that as well. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 you know, th- those are kind of custom segments. Um, they do come with a, a, a much higher level of um, budgetary requirement of over £100,000. But that's kind of fine for brands that can do that and have that size of audience. It's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And it's just, you know, there, there's other things that we can do in terms of target people by viewing passion. You know, we did have a client who wanted to sell some European golf breaks um, a little while ago, but they only wanted to target people who watched the Ryder Cup. And we said, well, it doesn't matter. Um, the Ryder Cup isn't on at the moment. So how do we do that? We can go back through the set-top box environment and put together a list of, in, say, 10 percentiles which are the households that watched most of the Ryder Cup, when it, which, which are the households that watched the Ryder Cup when it was on last time, and then target them. Now, that doesn't have to be placing an ad in the Ryder Cup because it wasn't on at the time, yeah. or even in, in a golf tournament. It doesn't matter. It's still the same household that are interested in golf because we know they watch the Ryder Cup. So there's, there's that kind of stuff that we can do as well, which is really, really interesting to some clients. It's really relevant because if they don't know who their audience is exactly, we can target them by their viewing viewing behaviors and i know you said that you're not in the media production side but so answer whatever you can here but i am curious about any trends that you see in terms of what's included in tv ads now and just the trends that you're noticing in the ads that you're running so just starting off on the length of ad i think earlier you noted that most ads are 30 seconds was that correct and if you could just break that down what what are the ad lengths available to advertisers through AdSmart? No, good question. Um, so the reason why we always recommend 30-second ads, at least if not all of the campaign, it's the majority of the campaign, is because in any given month, probably 70 to 75% of the ads on TV are 30 seconds long. And because we're superimposing your ad, it has to be the exact same time end over a 30-second ad. That means we've got more opportunities to deliver and deliver the reach and frequency that I mentioned. But you can buy normal TV-traded time length, so 10 seconds, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 60s. Um, and in the digital environment, you can use six seconds upwards. Uh, obviously, if you are running a, 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 a an ad on our digital YouTube channels, be it Sky Sports YouTube channel, if your ad is less than 20 seconds long, then it becomes not skippable as well. So there are other time lengths in the other platforms, but on TV, it's best to use a 30-second ad, um, if not all the time, most of the time. And anything else on the the trend in TV ads? So this is really to close us out. I imagine that you're excited to talk. We actually talked in this episode about Sky Glass and technology. But anything that you're really excited about when it comes to the future of TV advertising, whether that's on the technology side, uh, maybe on the software or engineering side, what, what interests you? We'll get more um, uh, capability from a data point of view to target um attitudinally not just um, kind of lifestyle and you know ownership car or an ev car um i think we will go that route and and you know in in the environment that sky 
uh, as a business operates, um, we're very environmentally aware. Um, and so the kind of green um, attitudes that people have is quite a key thing to us as well as to many clients that we work with. So I think those kind of things are interesting to see how we can develop. I think it's really interesting how we can work across multi-platforms doing what we've done so well in addressable world for the last 10 years and see how we can help clients work out what is the best um, way to deploy their budget um, by using all of the available platforms that we have to target their specific audience. And I think anything to do with reporting and, and um, insight and, you know, if, if clients go into this um, with an open mind that it's a test and learn environment, um, generally they scale up from spending maybe 10 grand to start with. And the, I think the 25% of the new advertisers last year spent between 10 and 12 grand with us on their first campaign. Now, that might just be a small percentage of what they could spend, but that's what they feel comfortable spending. They're quite quickly, and the exciting part is not selling a dream here. I mean, this is something that's amazing that we are working in um, and, and what the tool that we have, but it's about you know going on a journey with the client. It's not just about selling them the first TV campaign and then leaving them to it and hoping it works. It's about giving them reports and insight to show how it does work and then scaling up to do it bigger and better and honing in on the bits that work the best and then you know, working up to the full budget and quite quite regularly clients will go from spending you know 10 grand in the first campaign to a quarter of a million pounds six months to a year later because they're seeing their return on investment and that's that's you know we're helping businesses in, and it's a very difficult climate now <laughs> although i think there is some good news coming at the moment where energy prices and inflation are going are going down although they are from very high levels um but you know across the across the kind of covid period i can't believe i've left it this long without mentioning that word um but <laughs> you know we we work with loads of smes um <clears throat> we incentivize some for with some free media campaigns to help yeah. support businesses but what we what we know going forward is we've got some real effective tools to help businesses do what they're trying to do which is earn money and and, and provide services so it's uh, it's not just media it's actually being really involved in what, what clients are aiming to do and that, that's i think probably the most exciting part you know every day i have a conversation with a client or an agency it's, it's never anything is is the same as it was the day before every every client has a different perspective even if they've got the same kind of target audience so it, it's always quite fresh and new and as sky is a very dynamic business anyway so it's a great environment to be in does it still excite you when you get to see you mentioned journey the word journey and i was thinking you're in the sales position head of sales so I was thinking that maybe you aren't so involved in the actual media creative, but I assume that you still, is there still that same level of satisfaction and enjoyment when you see someone that you've bought into using Sky Ads Smart for the first time and then eventually you see that ads running on TV in front of you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I might be head of sales, but I've still got a target that's bigger than the rest of the team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of, we kind of lead from the front because that's, I think, how how you you get to work best with your team and inspire the team to do the same as what as, as what you're doing um yeah it's great to, to see a client use tv for the first time go through all those hurdles and challenges that hopefully we generally eliminated to actually see how it affects their business and then help them do it bigger and better okay well i've enjoyed your address on addressable television so thanks for that steve if people want to learn more about you Sky Ad Smart. Perhaps they even want to think about getting started using Sky Ad Smart. Where can they find you? Yeah, so um, we've got a, a website um, which is called AdSmartFromSky.co.uk. You can go to the Sky Media website and you'll get to us. I've, I'm on LinkedIn as Steve Wild. Uh, you'll find me there. I've got uh, my email address is Steve Wild, as in animal. W I L D. Uh, sorry, steve.wild at sky.uk. Very happy to uh, converse with anybody uh, that wants to have a conversation. And I'm assuming, I had, actually haven't seen these myself yet, but the case that you mentioned case studies, I'm always curious after listening to episodes like this, the case studies of other companies that have done well. Are case studies accessible via the website you just mentioned or will people have to email you to access them? Yeah, so we've just loaded three new video testimonial case studies to the website today, or certainly they will get live right. this week. 
um, which are clients sitting down in Sky's office being filmed talking about their experience with Sky and AdSmart. And there's nothing better than that because we, we're not selling it. They're, they're just talk, t- talking you through their experience of how it's worked and why they're coming back to do it more. So there's you know, there's one from Bridgman, which is a upmarket furniture business. There's one from Breathe, which is a HR um, uh, business to business tool. Um, and then there's one from Far Away Pizzas, who are obviously in a very competitive food market, and they're into their second campaign. And yeah, go and go and watch the videos. But we always say though, nothing sells TV better than a TV advert. So we we regularly um, compile lists of uh, ads that have worked with AdSmart in. Um, in, a, in sectors and then provide clients who are perhaps just a little concerned as to what would they say in an ad. So look, why don't you have a look at what all of your other competitors or businesses in your sector have done? And and that just works like a dream. And you, know, you always need, from a creative point of view, to allow the creatives to be creative. Tell them what you don't want. Don't tell them what you do want because then they can be creative. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, seeing a TV ad, that you know has worked on TV in the way that I've described really helps uh, kind of de-risk any, any any thoughts that you had of not using TV yourself. Well, I'll be checking those out. Listeners, I hope you do too. Steve, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. This has been the Internet Marketing Podcast. Take care. Yeah.